gentlemen, please welcome the Vice Chairman of the East Riding of Yorkshire Council, Council of Business Practice, and the Council of Mr. Ian Smith, and the Legionnaires of the Legio of Big Eyes, Victrix Ibaraka. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've got, I can see what I'm doing here. Thank you very much, Tony. Another fantastic welcome, sir. Very important. Right, uh, well, welcome to this, the first of the uh, talks we've promised at the, um, at the launch a few months ago. It's been, a, it's been really quick. Things have been happening really quick. Um, things to do have happened, but this week have happened, and it's up at the moment. And, uh, You'll hear about that later on. But first, it's that. Sound for hearing aid there. <laughs> 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 Go to space service. <laughs> Come forward. I'll try, try a bit louder then. Right, to start this session, I'd like to do a bit of a roll call to thank the Centurion Club members who are still so to be here today. And without what we could do with the future, our future may be restricted. So thanks go to Shane and Abby Webster, Louise and Matthew Parks, Julian and Philip Fuller, Tony and Kathleen Yalbray, Neil Telfer, Richard Mowdy, Paul Doherty, Jenny and Ian Stanley, Robert Charlton, Lindsay State Agent, Alan Townshend, and Elliot Caponeo. So thank you for, your, for being with the Centurion Club. Today we're doing things a little bit different to last time, and we're actually going to be streaming this event directly on the internet. To the rest of the world. So if you've got any issues with being seen, you back your head being seen, uh, please keep out of view of the cameras. This week's been a very exciting, exciting as we've received some spectacular results from last year, last week's ground penetrating radar survey done on the bears. David, David Stadium came all the way from Eastbourne, trod 28 kilometres up and down the playing field to get the result which he's got. Absolutely brilliant. But at this moment in time, as he hasn't actually gone out to the to the rest of the world, uh, I'd like to keep it within the community. Or at least up till about 10, uh, 20 past five tonight when I believe that Chris Rolf is doing a piece on BBC Look North. So let's get on with today's events and I'll hand you over to Dr. Hawking who will tell you a bit about Parisi. <laughs> a lot about the Parisi. <laughs> and other things he knows about. <laughs> ah. And to uh, oh, cool. inform you of the latest news on the bears. Peter. Right, thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming again, and it's brilliant to see such a large audience here. How I think, well, I haven't you got anything better to do on a Sunday afternoon? Uh, it, these gentlemen here are not to stop me from escaping, so I promise I'll, I'll behave myself. Otherwise, he's got this thing. Just a quick anecdote. Uh, there's a story uh, in one of the Roman authors about a centurion who was nicknamed, I forgot the Latin was, pass me another one, because he kept breaking these on the back of his legionaries. That's a vine staff. It, his own soldiers did him in. Cautionary note for centurions there. I have to get my own back. Anyway, so the Parisi. What I'm aiming to do, I hope, is tell you how important the area that you all live in is archaeologically. You often hear things about Stonehenge and Wessex and all the rest of it. We are just as important. But when you travel around the East Riding of Yorkshire, you would hardly know it because it's a prime agricultural area and of course people have got to farm and want to keep it like that. There's not that much to see above the ground. So most of what I'll be talking about now is many years of research by archaeologists, not just me, but quite a lot of this is be, be about research that I've been doing now for well over 30 years. So the Parisi. Well, here we are on a nice sunny afternoon in Bruff. Maybe not at the moment you would like being in, in Istanbul, 
But you think, why on earth is he starting this talk with a picture of the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul and the library of it? Well, the reason is this. Ibarakon Legio Digamma Nikoros Kamalodunum Pros Ois Peri Pon Eulamenon Kolpe Parisai Koi Polis Petuaria. It's Greek to me, and it's Greek to Ptolemy as well. Ptolemy of Alexandria, one of the greatest geographers and polymaths of the ancient world, produced a large atlas of the world as he knew it from various sources. And this is the first mention of Petuaria and the Parisi. And the translation there is Ibar Arcone. Notice the Greek spelling there. Remember, the eastern half of the Roman Empire continued to speak Greek all the time. Um, Camelodunum, near a bay, suitable for a harbour, are the Parisoi and the town Petuaria. So there you are. With, I am pretty sure that the town that I'm speaking in now and you are living in, if you do live in Brough, was mentioned first by this person, by Ptolemy in Alexandria. So this is the earliest surviving version of it. Um, the Codex Serologiensis, and uh, it's in the Topkapi Palace uh, in Istanbul, and it dates to about 1300 or so. There are other maps of, that show the Parisi. This is a rather wonky version. They didn't know where Scotland was, but I don't think this is particularly Ptolemy's fault. What you've got to remember is that manuscripts like this are copies of copies of copies of copies of copies quite often. They're done by medieval monks. Uh, sometimes the original's decayed or uh, is lost or something like that. And uh, one historian is pretty certain that the chap didn't quite in big enough piece of vellum to put the map on how it should be <laughs> with Scotland on the top. So cheapskate medievalist, remember vellum was an expensive material, uh, it decided to do it sideways. So somebody copied this and so Ptolemy's uh, geography looks rather wonky when in actual fact it isn't. Now, the map does show the tribal areas of Roman Britain. One thing to remember, it's quite important, that we're looking at the situation during the Roman Empire, when Britain is well and truly subjugated, and Antoninus Pius has extended up beyond Hadrian's Wall up to what became known as the Antonine Wall. It was, to, it obviously, to withdraw later on, uh, but it does mention uh, the uh, tribal area. Another interpretation, this absolutely splendid map in a large book, I really irritated the librarians of the university library who had two copies of the original here because they had to go into the basement and extract this marvellous book, which I think ought to be on display somewhere. It's Drake's Ibarakum. And you can see the date there, 1736, and this is one of the first attempts to actually map the territory of the Parisi. Uh, but there are a few issues with it, things that we wouldn't particularly agree with today. It restricted the Parisi to the area around Bridlington because that was thought to be a safe haven bay mentioned by Ptolemy. And most of the Roman place names are no longer accepted. Apart from Deventio, uh, the, most people accept Malton as being Deventio, but there's quite good evidence that Stamford Bridge is also a candidate for this. After all, it is on the River Derwent, and we know there's extensive Roman settlement along a major Roman road to York. So, we're in a very important place geographically in the Iron Age and Roman period, because we are on the edge of an estuarine tidal inlet, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Ptolemy writes, near which on Opportunum Bay are the Parisi and the town Petuaria. 
Now, an American scholar of classics uh, noted this. No reasonable emendation will put Petuaria on a bay, and I can't tell whose error it is either. Well, quite a lot of research that I've been involved in with various people at Hull University, Durham University, and others have shown that there was a tidal estuarine inlet, uh, which I'll show you in a moment, where the question mark has appeared, which may even have been this very bay. More about Roman Bruff later, but I just want to put in some context. We'll see this map again when we come to look at the Roman period. Archaeology is more about just picking up things or recording artefacts. In order to understand the, uh, our history properly, you need to place all these things within the landscape. And there are various important criteria to think about. One is the geology. Where did people get building stone from? What's the best method of farming? Which brings us to the other colourful map there. I know you won't be able to read all the names, but you should, I hope, be able to see the colours. You notice the mass of white there? That's the Yorkshire Wolds. And it's very good, but fairly thin farmland. Uh, freely draining, perfect for ancient farmers. The blue, which you can see along the uh, Hull Valley area here, you can see the pointer uh, along the Hull Valley there, is um, flood deposit at various periods, the same as on the other side of the walls, in the region where I was actually brought up, uh, the Funa Valley. You say, Funa? Well, actually, that's how we pronounced it. Foulness is what the Ordnance Survey call it. I didn't know what this Foulness River was. I mean, Ted, our foreman, and Frank Watson, uh, uh, who was his dad, said... Uh, Oh, we're going down to Funa to pick some taties. Right, anyway, so there's East Yorkshire. Split up into various zones. Holderness, which as you know, is the fastest uh, decaying coastline in Britain. Uh, very flat. Hull Valley, Yorkshire Wolds, Vale of York, Vale of uh, Pickering at the top, North Yorkshire Moors, and so on. But a distinct area. Well, for a long time, we've been interested in the Humber and what it's doing at this end. And various calls have been made across it, going through the deposits, and we've found some really quite uh, interesting things. The dots on the map on the left show the work of an undergraduate from Durham University, supervised by Dr. Jim Innes, who called across those de deposits to try and find... Uh, out how far this estuarine tidal inlet extended. We know that in the Neolithic, that's the time of the first farmers. And before that, there was a major flood event, similar, I suppose, to the one that happened in 2013 and 2010 and previously. But in those days, there was no drainage and sea level was rising in any case. So an inlet was formed in the dark blue soil there. Although minus 2.2 metres ordnance datum seems lower than present, relative sea levels were lower as well. So this marked a very major change in the landscape. Perhaps the more worrying one, and something perhaps you need to be aware of, uh, is this one. During the Iron Age at the top there, which we're heading uh, opposite Churchill home on Spalding Moor and all our stuff to, to Mark at Wheaton, we've got brackish deposits, that means a salt water flood tidal deposits at um, plus half a metre to 0.7 of a metre plus, that means that much above today's level. And as sea levels continue to rise, that is what I'm afraid we can expect. Remember, there's a cycle of sea level rise and climate change as well. Well, you may think, well, how does he know this? Well, all you need to do 
is look at some of these deposits, like this one. And before any health and safety executive people come in, well, we had hard hats with us, but by the time we'd walked down to the mall pond here, or the lagoon rather, uh, we'd actually left them there and thought, oh, shall we go back? Perhaps we ought to have done. This is Dr. Jim Innes, and he's taking samples through. Note on the top layer, there's a thick layer of grey clay. That is flood deposit. That is marine, that sea-laid alluvial deposit, which came right up the Humber to Hazone. Underneath that, the brown peat that you can see was from a Bronze Age forest. So the Faraby boats out there were on the edge of woodland in a creek. And that land, whole landscape changes probably between 1000 and 800 BC or so. And, well, sadly, we all know about this, and uh, it seemed a bit exploitative, but uh, it, at the same time as my Parisi book came out, uh, we had these terrible flood deposits. So the Yorkshire Post actually picked up on it, and uh, the, the headline there is, Iron Age sea, sh sea Surge Changed the Face of the Humber, which it did. So we've got a very different geography in the Iron Age period which had replaced woodland. If you go down to Ferriby Foreshore, the same at Cleethorpes, you can see Bronze Age trees from an ancient forest that extended a long way in that lowland area close to the Humber. Catastrophes like that do have an effect. And this is where we really start the archaeology in the early Iron Age period. Imagine you're a farmer up in Ingleborough or somewhere like that in the upland areas. It doesn't stop raining. You can't plant your crops properly because of climate change. Uh, where do you go? Well, you might want to go into the better farmland of the Yorkshire Wolds, but there's somebody else there. And it seems pretty clear that in this era there was conflict uh, in society. And all over East Yorkshire and mapped by John Robert Mortimer, we've got these fantastic networks of linear earthworks, or the so-called walled dikes. One of East Yorkshire's best-kept archaeological secrets, the plan below there is Huggett Dikes. Well worth a visit. Uh, it's um, right to Rome land. Uh, it's scheduled an ancient monument, of course, but it is really spectacular, as you can see by the size of the trees there. Five sets of banks and ditches, which control access between the whole valley and the Vale of York on a high bit of the world. So who was doing this? At around about the same time, these types of settlements appear. And most of them are on hilltops with good vantage points, and they do seem to control the landscape. One of the most important of these is Thwing, uh, Opton Grange. Uh, the site is known actually as Paddock Hill, and it was excavated by Terry Manby in the 1980s. Still, unfortunately, yet to be published, but the artifacts are in Hull Museum, and you've got this fantastic painting here of this very large roundhouse inside an enclosure. There are other hill forts as well, such as the one at Boltby Scar, right up in, in the north. Important because it can be argued that a string of hill forts along there were to form the boundary of the territory of the Parisi. Grimthorpe was also excavated by Ian Stead and the picture there on the bottom right, you can just about make out the circuit of the defences. The rather nice drawing on the bottom left is the key site as well. A bit of chalk had slid off the Yorkshire Wolds, and this was exploited for an early Iron Age settlement at Staple Howe, excavated by Tony Brewster. So we've got probably chiefs within these enclosures controlling the landscape. It's divided up, cleared, and farmed to a great extent, uh, divided up by those linear earthworks. Now, I was particularly interested in one of these and had a master's student who was doing work plotting 
uh, aerial photographs that have been taken since uh, Cathy Sturtz's great work, Ancient Landscapes of the Yorkshire Wolds, which collated and plotted any aerial photograph showing archaeology that she could get hold of in the um, plotting uh, features from the uh, Iron Age, uh, Roman period, and earlier into prehistory. And you can just about make out on the screen those red lines. I hope you can see those okay. There's a double uh, ring of them, an inner ring and an outer ring. So as part of the project, I got James Lyle, who most of you have met, who was here last time as a geophysicist, to do a geophysical survey. And this is what we got. And it's one of those occasions when you nearly fall over and think, wow, can you see in the center a massive roundhouse? That is identical to the one at Thwing. So here, just outside Middleton and on the Wolds at Kipling House Farm, we've got a hitherto unknown hill fort. Yes, the outer ring was known, and it was suggested it might be a, bro a later Bronze Age, early Iron Age ring fort, but our proof wasn't found until last year, again through geophysical survey. So this year, thanks to grants from the East Riding Archaeological Society and the Yorkshire Archaeological and Historical Society, and keen volunteers, we were able to dig the trenches which you can see there. And you can actually vaguely make out the outline of this hill fort in the, sugar, in the copper potatoes. The ditches were massive. That's a two-metre ranging pole. So imagine they did have iron tools at this time, but they weren't particularly good or efficient. They dig this out with an uh, antler of a red deer and an ox shoulder blade as a shovel and using baskets, digging out probably, well, it's nearly two metres deep, four metres wide into solid chalk. And you can see on the bottom photo, uh, you've got a load of rubble, which has been a big bank. So really, another very impressive discovery. And there are a number of these, and here they are planned out. We haven't yet put, uh, on, I have to do another <laughs> edition of the book, I'm afraid. Uh, but, um, you know, these are the type of hill forts that we get. The one at Grimthorpe's interesting because it does appear to control access to water, which is a very important resource uh, on the walls. So here's a map of these ring forts controlling the landscape in the early Iron Age period. Lots of questions. Who actually were these people? Well, to uh, archaeologists in the past, the solution was easy. These were invaders at what we call the Hallstatt period of the early Iron Age, who came over from the European continent, and there they were perched upon Stapel Howe uh, as a defensive spot uh, and controlling the landscape. And some of the evidence for this was the close resemblance of these bronze razors that you can see here, with those on the continent, especially in the Netherlands and Denmark, or southern Denmark. So, for some time, there was this idea by Christopher Hawkes and others of invasions, a wave of invaders at this period. We know, of course, that they had the means to do this. The picture there, ah, I think you're on there, Ken. Uh, the picture of one of the Ferriby boats being excavated with Ted Wright. And um, the radiocarbon dates make one of the Ferriby boats the earliest planked boat in Europe. Again, another plus for the archaeology of eastern Yorkshire. So certainly the means would have existed for people to move about and come across to this region. A similar case can be made in the later Iron Age, again much disputed by archaeologists and historians. But one cannot deny that somewhere around 400 BC or so, suddenly right across the landscape we get these things appearing. They are called square barrows for obvious reasons. They tend to have central burials in them. There are also small round ones as well. 
And the closest parallels that have been found to these are on the continent of Europe at uh, various places in the Ardennes and Champagne regions of France. They do extend across further to the east, but there does seem to be a fairly close correlation between the two. And as a just graduate, I had the good fortune to dig with the Dr. Ian Stead of the British Museum at the Vilsa return site. And apart from the cars driving on the other side of the road and the trees being slightly different, I could have been on the Yorkshire Wolds. The chalk landscape is almost identical. That is a very important point to bear in mind. People go and live in land they're used to farming on. And remember, in those days, one couldn't trundle down to the nearest supermarket. You were reliant on what you could grow yourself. There are other reasons for thinking there are very close parallels with the European continent as well. Well, this is the distribution of uh, square barrows in eastern Yorkshire. But if I was to extend this map to the whole of Britain, you can see this is by far and away the biggest. So East Yorkshire is special in the Iron Age. The artefacts as well closer resemble those of France. And thanks to Rod Mackey, who did a lot of research on this himself, and he uh, lent me this, this slide. And you can see, look at the brooches, look at the bangles, they're virtually identical. If these aren't the same people, they've got very close connections, either by trade or exchange. Now, these people are known as the Arras culture. I'll come to that in a moment. But one uh, explanation for this similarity may be trading links. Professor Barry Cunliffe, one of the greatest of all Iron Age archaeologists, hypothesized zones of influence. An Atlantic zone, and a North Sea zone, and a Central zone. And even today, there are close similarities between the western fringes of Britain right down into Brittany and beyond, and resemblances in the North Sea. But another telling point, as you can see from the map, is the distribution of East Yorkshire's most famous archaeological treasure, chariot burials. Look at that distribution map. There's a cluster in East Yorkshire, and the biggest cluster is in Ardennes Champagne area and in the Paris Basin. Chariot burials do extend further eastwards, and in other cultures they chariot burials as well, but in terms of Britain, we've got something like 24 out of the 20. 26 or 7 chariot burials in the UK. There's something really unusual going on there. So here's Arras. It was first identified by Abraham de la Prime, who was a, curious, a curate at Holy Trinity Church in Hull. When he was going on a journey, uh, seeing the Dean of York, and he reports seeing these small burial mounds which he intended to dig. Fortunately, he didn't, and this was left some years later by a group of Yorkshire gentry who carried out an excavation between 1815 and 1817 and found the finds that you can see here, three chariot burials, and the burial with a lot of uh, fine items, the glass necklace here, the coral mounted uh, pendant, and also a lost gold ring, last seen in the hands of one Canon Greenwell, who was a great excavator of barrows, a, a canon of Durham Cathedral, who in the end of the 19th century spent a lot of time digging on the Yorkshire Wolds. So, you can see the air photograph can vaguely make out some of the square burrows. So, we uh, did a geophysical survey as well last year, really wanted to do something to celebrate the 200th anniversary of those discoveries. And using magnetometer again, mapped out some of the burrows which you can see there. And here they are 
in close-up. The rather weird background is caused by the geology, which is uh, caused by a combination of uh, freezing and thawing and also possible movement of glacial material. One of the worrying things about all this is on that site, we've got nine Bronze Age Rand Barrows, which are the only scheduled monuments on the site. And again, we've got this balance between farming and the past. We cannot live in a museum, we need to eat. But uh, maybe you can just see some of the square barrows in the bottom corner here still showing up. Uh, but sadly, if one was to go to that field today, you had absolutely no idea there was anything of any significance there. What was in some of these? Well, most of us know about these amazing chariot burials. And I think I cracked a joke last time about um, John Dent being interviewed by Radio 4. I don't know who it was. I think it was Brian Redhead who was on that morning. It was either him or John Timpson. And I woke up in 1984 one morning and thought, whoa, what, what's going on? Well, who's that on the radio? And it was my old friend, John Dent, who used to be one of the Humber, uh, Humberside Archaeology Unit's archaeologists. And he was describing the amazing discovery of the chariot burials in 1984. Three of them were found at once. And uh, he was asked to describe what a chariot burials looked like for listeners. There was a pause and he said, uh, it looks like somebody's fallen off a bicycle. I think that's brilliant. And, and then my mate Kevin Lee here, who's a um, keeper of archaeology at Scunthorpe Museum, uh, slightly adapted it. And to get the full picture, you need to see the reconstruction because they used to put a quarter pig with these people, the front quarters. And Kevin's idea that the bicycle accident was caused by a pig running across the road. So archaeologists soon make things up, of course. Right, anyway, lots of chariot burials, wet and garden area being very special. Uh, we've got all these, the latest, which is found by Rod Mackey uh, and Kate Dennett in 2001. And you can see the range of them there. But I was rather staggered last year to get a breathless phone call from Paul Aware of uh, map archaeology from Malton saying, <laughs> Peter, we found a chariot burial, <laughs> and it was this one. Unfortunately, there's not much of the chariot left, apart from one wheel. Uh, actually, there's nothing left of the wheel. That brilliant piece of archaeological excavation that you can see here is a different stain, different texture in the soils that gives us the spokes of that wheel, and what survives is that iron tire that goes around it. But the absolutely remarkable thing about this one was the fact that it was buried with two horses. There's only one other known in eastern Yorkshire that's like that, and that was the King's Barrow at Arras. You may find out about something else uh, in December if you watch Digging for Britain. So, back to this connection. For some years, people had argued that the people may not have been... Um, invaders because there were differences between the chariot burials. However, radiocarbon dates have shown that, yes, the ones around wet wine, dated about 250 BC, are slightly different than the continental ones. But there is a date from a chariot burial at Newbridge in Edinburgh of the 5th century BC. And also in a site not far away from here, uh, the skeleton of an elderly female was uh, analysed with radiocarbon dating and also found to date in a square barrow, no chariot this time, to the 5th century BC. It's near the Humber. So I'm pretty sure that there's some movement of people across the Channel and North Sea. The one on the right-hand side is a typical French example where the chariot is buried intact and the, the fittings from the chariot harness are buried special, uh, separately. And in there you've also got metal objects as well. 
We're talking about the Iron Age, and one of my main research interests has been the production of early iron. It, this may not look particularly pretty, uh, but this is the largest, or was, the largest slag heap in Iron Age Britain. It's now the third, and the radiocarbon dates are really quite interesting, as you'll see in a moment. It was a discovery made during my uh, research for my masters back along the Funa Valley where I was brought up uh, I asked the farmer if he'd found any iron slag oh he said you mean Nosman as they used to call it and he said yeah there was a heap of it in there but not much of it was showing above the surface so we excavated it and found this slag heap so I don't expect you to read all those dates, but it's probably around 300 BC or thereabouts, maybe earlier, maybe slightly later, but that does make it contemporary with those chariot burials. It is remarkable, because thanks to experimental archaeology, uh, we know quite a lot about what that heap means. It would have needed 9,000 kilos of ore, 3,000 kilos of charcoal and the product of the equivalent to 47 hectares of woodland. I don't think they chopped whole forests down. They had more sense than that. They were managing the woodland to supply fuel in the form of charcoal. But why does this relate to chariots? Well, of course, there's all the iron needed in the chariot. To make one kilo of fully refined bar iron takes between 8 and 25 person days, depending on the ore type and the technology used. And we know from experimentation that one of the tyres, which cost 12 kilos and 36 kilos of irons needed, and you're talking about 288 person days for the iron alone in that chariot. So iron, we, th we don't think about it. It's rusty and horrible, isn't it? It's, it's no good. But to Iron Age people, this is a very valuable commodity. And to be able to bury this amount of wealth showed uh, your status. At the same time, around this major iron industry, which you can see on this map here, uh, we've got the Hazom log boat, which I found in 1984 which is a, sadly a shadow of its former self, but was once in really good condition, found by a draining machine which was blocked, and I asked the farmer if he could excavate, and in an excavation directed by Professor Martin Millet with uh, Sean McGrail, uh, we managed after six weeks to get this out, excavated, and into Hull Museum. Some years later, I found out about another log boat uh, near Newport, a South Car farm. Look at the map. With this rise sea level, we've got a very, very different area around the Humber. So where do these people live? Well, there are settlements all over eastern Yorkshire, as you can see. And this is my interactive bit with the audience. Who could tell me why those settlements are in a straight line like that? Coast? No. They're a bit away from the coast. Anybody? Nope. Nope. Not quite. Right, simple. It's a pipeline. One of the big problems of the archaeology of Holderness is that unless you get a year like this year with droughts, crop marks don't show, which is a major way of archaeologists finding sites. And with a thicker overburden as well, magnetometers and other things like that don't work. So you've got to use other methods. And the only then all those Iron Age settlements came as a surprise. When they stripped the topsoil off, suddenly all these Iron Age settlements appeared that they didn't know were there. Another cautionary note for planners as well. You never know what's going to turn up. 
What the, the settlement's like, on the walls you get strings of uh, enclosures on droveways known as ladder settlements because they look a bit like ladders. Lowlands, uh, settlements with big deep ditches and so on. Uh, you can see some of them like the ones that, where I used to work at Wilberforce College once. Uh, Salt's House Road and North Cave and Aram done by the East Riding Archaeological Society. Specialised for dealing with wet conditions. And below that, the reconstruction is of a roundhouse at Hayton. They're not simple mud huts. Look at the size of them compared to the people. They would last 25 years or more. So we also looked at a hilltop site at Nunburnham on the Yorkshire Wolds. The big blob in the middle is a ditch, sorry, a, a pit, rather, a chalk pit. And this site can be really divided into a bit with burial on the top and on the left, the big settlement. Ritual, and burial, profane, domestic. And they're going up to the top of this wold and Unburnham, probably at festival days in the Celtic year, um, eating lots of sheep, but lots of pig and um, cattle as well, some cattle. And there's some interesting deposits in those ditches, animal bones and the little votive axe. There's antler as well and this cow skull buried on the bottom of it. In the late Iron Age, we're pretty certain that um, people were still warlike who can see these little figurines of these warriors. There are some uh, in uh, various other places in Malton uh, as well. More evidence for people being warlike are swords found at various places. Like in a burial at Grimthorpe, we've got spears, swords, shields. And here, not very far away from where we are now, just up cave, further up Cave Road into South Cave, we've got the South Cave weapons cache of five swords in superbly decorated sheaths with 33 spearheads, possibly a series of warriors and their war bands who buried their armaments just as the IRA used to do, probably as a weapons cache. They were carefully curated, hence their condition, and they were found by a group of metal detectorists and properly excavated. Here you can see the centre one, amazing craftsmanship, and most scholars argue that these were done in eastern Yorkshire. We had a tradition of fantastic blacksmiths, metal workers, who were able to use lots of different materials. The funny white stuff on the top is in fact the ivory from elephants and there's also sperm whale ivory on there as well. They're using enamel. And this hoard was probably buried at the time the Romans crossed the Humber. With them were the spears. And we've got a tradition in East Yorkshire which is a bit bizarre. It does appear that during the burial process, people threw spears into burials. Is it a military salute? Is it to make sure Dracula-like that the guy doesn't get out of the grave again? But some of them have many spears thrown in, and some of them actually go into the corpse. They're clearly high status. They're often buried with pork and other artifacts as well. It's an odd thing. And the same was found at Pocklington in 2015. Here this uh, man has been buried with his sword and you can just about make out some of the spearheads uh, around the burial as well. Which takes us on to the South Cave spears. Well, here they are. And a PhD student of mine finished a very, very good PhD on spears in Iron Age Britain and she came up with some interesting results. However, what's pertinent to this talk is do these rituals and a method of fighting give us the name of the tribe? Because 
There are other places called Dalgovich in the Antonine itinerary. Dalgo uh, is, means a thorn in, in the Celtic language, in Old Welsh. And it can be interpreted as the town of the spear fighters. And Pa is the Old Welsh for a spear. And the tribal name can be interpreted as the spear people from their method of fighting. Another alternative uh, equates par with the Celtic word for a cauldron. But the evidence to support that isn't quite as strong. Well, here's the hoard in situ. What is strange is it was buried under sherds of Dressel 20 olive oil amphorae. This was to hold olive oil. Irish people didn't use olive oil, as far as we know. Uh, and... Obviously, they were in contact with the Romans who'd occupied the southern bank of the Humber by around AD 60, when Lincoln was founded. And through a site called the Red Cliff at Ferriby, which is now disappearing fast into the Humber, we've got evidence for a trading depot which connected the unconquered northern part of Britain with the conquered re region. Exchange of goods, softening people up, getting them used to uh, Roman delicacies and things like that, as they'd done elsewhere in Britain. And there was for a long time a question as to how compliant the Iron Age people were. But the finding of all these weapons and things suggests that they were probably just as warlike as any other peoples. We get the first coins coming in from the south bank of the Humber and the first wheel thrown pottery as well at this time. But finally, due to a scandal written about by the Roman writer Tacitus and others, uh, after a truce had been made with the powerful tribe of the Brigantines in the north of England, the truce was broken uh, around AD 70 to 71 and the Romans march northwards. Nice evidence for this is this altar, uh, at the top of an altar of victory, uh, found uh, under a hedge bottom uh, in Bolton near Pocklington. A series of forts was constructed, like this one at Hayton. You can make out the playing card shape. And the one here at Brough on Humber from Corder's work is something very similar to this. And so this iron ring of forts is made on the possible boundaries of Parisi territory to hold it against an attack by blokes dressed like these and they're wearing uh, armour more or less of that period to go north. We know that a detachment rescued Cartimandua and it took them though 30 more years or so to get anything like peace in the north because we know from the Vindolanda writing tablets from the early 2nd century, around 100, 101, sometime like that, that the Britons, the Britunculi, the wretched little Britons, were still being troublesome. Well, here we are. The other type of armour that these chaps aren't wearing, this is Lorica Squamata, and you can see evidence there from Malta Museum for it. So all around we get Roman forts, and this is where Bruff really comes into the picture. Roman roads are eventually laid down as well, and settlements grow along the Roman roads. Here we are at Bruff. You saw this map last time. We've got more dots to add to it now. So the tidal inlet and the haven are still there and very important. And we've got uh, distributions of settlements along the Roman roads and so on. The red marks where the fort is and the black, the walled enclosure, which we'll come on to later. Well, the outline of that wall showed it very clearly in the birth playing fields, as you can see, the dark lines showing up. The street, diangular streak across there is a modern path created by people walking up and down. And we're anxious to do more work. So this is where we were last Sunday. You see the geophysicists <laughs> behaving themselves there with our wonderful centurion behind them, keeping them in order. It, it's not obligatory. You didn't have a centurion on every geophysical survey. For a start, you couldn't do a magnetometer survey because they've got too much metal on them. 
So that's James doing a magnetometer survey. Yeah. Which? Uh, cut it because it's. Uh, Right, anyway, here's what 